Storm DJ's podcast. Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the Storm DJ's podcast, where we sit down with some of the biggest names in the industry and get to know them on a personal level. In this, our 24th podcast episode, we had the pleasure of speaking with DJ Scottos, a vastly experienced open format DJ with over 20 years behind the decks. With countless performances at some of the UK's most famous clubs and venues, DJ Scottos is a true expert. In this exclusive interview, DJ Scottos opens up about his life, how he became a DJ, and why he thinks everyone belongs in a bucket. His unique perspective on music and life is sure to leave you inspired and entertained. So without further ado, let's jump right in and get to know DJ Scottos only on Storm DJ's podcasts. Um, so what is your current stage name and have you had any previous ones? I haven't actually. I've, I've always kept the same one that it's uh, it's DJ Scottos. It's a merch here as well. Um, my <laughs> website, um, little plug, but um, yeah, I've had it for really since like um, the 90s and I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail when you ask it, but um yeah, it's stuck with me forever now. But um, does it have any particular sort of place it's come from, the the special OS on the end of your name? It does. Um, so a friend of mine, very close, uh, unfortunately, actually, um, a lot passed away a couple of years ago, but he used to be an MC in the garage scene. And, um, and garage was quite big in Cyprus in the sort of... Um, in the late nineties and everyone, for some reason, when they came back from Cyprus, every had like an os at the end. So he came back and suddenly started calling me Scottos. Um, and then it just kind of stuck really. And then when you've got to come up with a DJ name, you're like, Oh, you know, my surname, it's not like, uh, it's not really ideal for a DJ name. So I thought, all right, there's probably loads of DJ Scott. There's probably Scott or Scotty, Scotty Anderson. So I thought, you know what, let's go with Scottos and <laughs> see how we go. And it's, and it's basically stuck ever since. Yeah, yeah, it works, it works. Um, in terms of your DJing and your DJ career and so forth, have you got a particular style that you stick with? I mean, obviously the gigs that you do with Storm are very much wide ranging in terms of the style, but have you got a, a preferred style you, you you like to play? Do you know, it's really hard because I'm I've sort of done my discos for so long, but I feel like if I'm going to, see where it kind of all started really i would say drum and bass jungle is kind of my my in my heart my go-to if i'm gonna play something in the car i'd say that's probably the music i would play but as you know i i, I kind of love everything really so it's very close first second third fourth but if you had to push me on one i would say drum and bass jungle is my my go-to mm -hmm. and is that sort of where you started in that in that scene was that where you started your djing yeah, so I, 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 that was where I bought the vinyls um, when I was going raving. And I thought, oh, that looks easy. I, I could do that. If they can spin some uh, some stuff on some 1210s, I could do that, right? <laughs> and as we all know, um, vinyl the, uh, mixing and uh, CDJs are very different. But that's where it started. Got some records in the bedroom. Drove my mum mad, the neighbours mad. Um, and then that kind of sort of slightly died away. And then I suddenly... Uh, the, the kind of mobile disco started and uh, I, it wasn't really ideal for using vinyl and playing drum and bass at a wedding. So it kind of died away a little bit. The love stayed there, but the actual kind of like, yeah, moving into the open format is kind of where it started. Excellent. Excellent. Um, you spoke about 1210s and CDJs. Have you got any sort of go-to equipment that you, you, you swear by now? Yeah, I think um, I, when I, when I did the, um, the, the CDJ course, uh, which my lovely wife, paid for um <laughs> you know she um it, you know when you i'd like a, one of those sort of what rubbish sort of cd mixers that you know kind of like the two three hundred pound ones and took it to there they went nah no nah, we don't we don't train you on that you this is what you train you on and that's when i got introduced to cdj's 2000 nexus and that was the that was it and i was kind of like it's kind of you've gone from driving a your mini to your ferrari right so you can't go back to the mini and it was just great <laughs> and i feel like i just kind of got that real I was taught on that and, you know, it just, it's just a different, different beast and so many more things to do, including like the mixer as well. We've got the, I, I like a, you know, the DJ, I think I was using 900 there, but when I got back, I, um, uh, okay, I haven't told my wife this, um, but I bought CDJs 
uh, at 2000 and the mixer. Um, never ever disclosed the amount, which I won't do now. But it's a, it's a lot more than <laughs> you just I think you just disclosed disclosing it to the uh, to the entire. Yeah, just don't ever show this to her. We've never, never done this, by the way. <laughs> You know, in the drum and bass scene, were there any particular artists that sort of influenced you? Um, 100%. Ronnie, Ronnie Size, 100%. anything like that? Oh, and, and do you know what? He's still, he's still, I still love this guy to bits now, is Andy C. Um, mm-hmm. My age, um, he made that song, the 30, you know, um, uh, 31 seconds, um, that, you know, uh, and it was just that song and his DJ style. And even now, he's just evolved and he's just like incredible. So he's the one that I, influenced me in music and to be a DJ. And um, anyone that was that literally just him or was there a sort of collection? Of- I'll say him on drum and bass, but then as, as uh, things evolved and obviously my best friend who was a garage, um, uh, got into, started going to sort of around the, around the country with him, it was DJ EZ. And I was lucky enough to stand as close as I am to his laptop and watch that guy on vinyl back then to see what he was doing I still don't know how he does it on vinyl and how he does it even know what I know now on mixers. It's just absolutely incredible how how he yeah. how he moves from what song to song. I still can't work it out. And I've been there looking at it. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. So for Garage, definitely him. Um yeah, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see him play. It's just different gravy. I, I probably have back in the day during during my youth. <laughs> um <laughs> Can you tell me about your first ever gig? So my first ever gig, uh, is, again, it's a embarrassing story, was I was too scared uh, to DJ on my own. And my, and I had loads of music that I nicked for my mum, um, which is part of why I do my discos. And my other friends, he did a little bit of DJing. We decided to do it together. <laughs> we wore the same shirt, the same jumper. Right. the same trousers and we did it together and we did it in this pub in um uh in in beckenham and uh it's really funny because we had similar styles of music but then one would play one song we're like no no this next one's gonna smash it and we ended up sort of like doing this for about four gigs and it, it was never gonna be a marriage made in heaven because and then they go you say something to mike no you say it so that was kind of how it started and obviously um Looking back there, you know, I can't stop talking now on microphones. But back then, it was like, no, oh, you do it, you do it. And it was just, yeah, I don't think yeah. you ever see people do uh, gigs together. But um, back then, it was like, it was like we needed to get, we needed to hold each other's hand to do mm-hmm. the first one. We're too scared to on our own. But um, but it set the scene, basically, to give us a little bit of confidence that we could do it, but we just didn't feel we could do it on our own. <laughs> so that's a bit so... embarrassing story, really, isn't it? It's not like a, oh, wow, I claim to fame, but I did it for my first gig there. It was wearing the same clothes and holding my friend's hand basically to get myself it's, through the night. It's good, it's good to to admit to kind of that, that, that kind of stuff. But I mean, <laughs> have you ever DJed with that person again since? No, not not in an open format, but we've, we've played, we've sort of evolved and we've done some um, sort of more clubby stuff and we've played on the same like, events <laughs> and stuff. But not, not literally back to back. We've done a few things on like a radio and stuff, but not, um, well, he's basically my best mate now and he's, Go for my kids, my my um, one of my daughters, sorry. So um, and it, yeah, so he's he's amazing, but uh, yeah, we we're, we're not ideal for for playing um for, for DJing <laughs> together anymore. So you, you didn't sort of think at any point you'd be a DJ duo? No, do you know what? I think it's just back then. You think about it's just, and I'm old by the way. It's just like this is 25 years ago, or maybe 27 years ago. So I'm 19. And you know, and things were different then. You know, and, you know, we had like CD crates, and we had like this big CD mixer, and everything was just big. Everything was heavy. Um, so actually, having two people were, were good then because you know it was just a nightmare doing gigs on your own. But no, I think it's I think when we realised and we could afford to do it on our own, and you start kind of like you could start to copy uh, CDs then. You know, you got you got the the CDR thing where it was, so you could start to yeah. copy your nails. 54s and stuff when we were able to to do that and go alone then, then we did it but until that point it was like oh mate no you've got my cds and it was kind of one of those moments so uh, that's kind of how why it really started because we didn't have enough to do it on our own but but and also uh we were scared yeah and looking back over your years of djing um does any particular gig stand out as being the the best gig ever um, well i sort of learned how to mix on the CDJs, there was um, when you've gone through the courses and, and did the elite course, there was an opportunity to to play Ministry of Sounds, 
not in the loft, which you get as a kind of start, but to play in the 103 room, which I did on a Friday night. And I had a really good time and it was absolutely packed. So I don't know how many people were in there, but it was just one of those nights where, you know, I've done the loft where you it's been empty. And to go to Ministry of Sound and go into that main room where everyone comes in, but then to see everybody really enjoying it for different reasons. Some could be uh, too many lemonades. Some people could probably have been on another level. It was just great. And I had a, gr a great reaction. And I probably came off that. I don't know if you've had that feeling, uh, uh, Adam, where you kind of like, you're sort of shaking slightly with uh, hmm. excitement where you just, you just like, you don't, you didn't want to get off, but you just, you just absolutely loved it. And it just kind of went so yeah. perfectly um, where nothing went wrong. It was like the mixing was like on point. Um, and yeah, I just felt great when I come off and yeah, it was just an amazing feeling. So yeah, that's probably the one that really sticks out to me the most. I've done, I've been abroad and done a few gigs, been nice to be in, in a place which is outside of the UK and not London, but to have mm. that kind of like that interaction that night was great. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Can't go wrong with ministry or unless it's completely no. empty, as you said. Um, <laughs> Can you remember your first ever music purchase and what format it was? I'm assuming it's going to be vinyl, but it could be. Oh, no, it was actually. I, I would say actually, it was a. It was a. God, this, this was a. This was a tape cassette actually. Mm. <laughs> um, I, I think it was like now forty or something, or now actually no, it was probably less. Than, I think it might be twenty seven, which is again. <laughs> I'm at that age now where I'm like, I'm even showing my age, which I remember my parents were saying to me, God, I'm showing my age now. I think it was a tape cassette. Yeah. Um, and, and I got, uh, it was one of the now, now 27s or something. And that was one of my first cassettes that I got. But like, yeah, obviously for sort of kind of DJ and sort of side of stuff, it was more vinyl then before and the CDs. I think Jungle, Jungle Mania was one of the CDs I got as well. But yeah, I think the tape cassette, I would say was my first proper, I bought it out of my own money, pocket money purchase. Excellent. Um... <laughs> I, I presume you've been through all the different formats though i mean you started with the the vinyl first of all moved to the cds and now you're all yeah. digital are you or have you, you, yeah, no, you still got actually, a vinyl collection yeah i have i have and actually my uh, even what's even uh, to add to that actually adam my, my um my mum gave me like um which i'm kind of giving back she gave me all the seven inch records I don't know if you remember them, like literally, yeah. but they were. She. This is why the the open format thing kind of really happened for me because I used to sleep hearing like seventies, eighties music, and she used to play all those seven inch records. She played, honestly, she had hundreds of probably a thousand actually, and she gave to me at one point, and I'm to the point where I never played them. But um, but yeah, I kind of went through that process, and also over the process of uh, years of trying to um to convert all the cds into digital like like do that process yeah. and load them all to try and oh that took ages and ages and ages but um now it's all done but uh, that's that was painful but yeah kind of gone through all of those excellent you've you've seen it all not like people people are starting and starting these days and they just go straight to digital exactly. they, do you know what it was like of... in the war do you know what it was exactly. like back then do you know how hard <laughs> yeah. it was carrying all these cases you turn up with one of those little <laughs> buddy usb sticks that's why I'm so much. That's what, you know what I mean. So, but there, yeah, it was. Um, God, oh, it was so hard work back then. Well, I know, I, I know. So old. I so old I just, like just well, I've been there as well. I've, I've carried many record bags over my shoulders before. So, it's uh, yeah, it was back breaking. I can't say it's piled on yeah. the muscle for me, but you know, <laughs> it just broke my back instead. <laughs> exactly, it does. It does. Um, so, moving on to some slightly different questions now. Um, how do you feel that AI is going to impact the DJ industry over the next five years plus? Do you know what? Again, I'll keep this, this answer short, but I was I was um, watching the podcast about this with um, with somebody and I've actually just applied for a job around AI. So, And I was talking about this as one of my answers in one of my interviews. So it's kind of a bit of a, a topic that's been quite in my mind. Um, it's actually... Um, there's a slight kind of concern, obviously, because you know we know now we're in the Spotify and all this sort of stuff that's happening, where things are becoming a little bit like you could, you know, do you need a DJ? You could put your playlist on and stuff. And now we're evolving to AI and stuff. It does concern me a little bit, but I feel like you know you can't write songs, you can't perfect things in the way because there's still that personality. Certain things you can't do with AI, I don't believe. But also making music that. You know uh, that 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 really does like um, you know to see that how that's going to look as well. But 
So I would say, a couple, yeah, I, it, it's something that I'm quite geeky about anyway. So I've worked in around AI anyway. So, um, but I do feel it's going to have a slight impact because you feel like now, if even with some of the music, um, you know, things like Spotify and stuff and Amazon and all these things that people use now, there is that concern. Do we really need a DJ? Do you know? Do we do we just hire the equipment and plug in, have the lights and stuff, and then plug in our thing and let it play for five hours? So yeah, there's that is there is a concern to that, but but at the same time, you need you, you still need a personality. You need someone that can you know know when to change a song, and you can't do that with AI. I don't think but it's it's going to be hard to train train me train AI to be like me is absolutely impossible. I That's can't say impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that you know what I'm talking about, Adam, don't you? So um, it would be very it, difficult to do that. It w- it would be very difficult. Unfortunately, it's becoming more and more easy. Um, and yeah, it's 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 a concern for all of us. But as you said, I think within the entertainment space, people want real people. They don't want computers to be doing stuff. So exactly. you know, it, it's it's something that's going to be. You know, it's going to be an impact on all of us everywhere, but human touch is always going to be human touch. So, can, can you imagine though, just on that last thing, can you imagine uh, an AI kind of like uh, doing some sort of microphone um, talking on there, and, it, and they sort of like sort of some kind of kind of create a I don't know wherever you are in the country, a northern accent voice or mm. or like an Essex. All right, guys, and I like mm. you know uh, or London stuff. It'd be interested to see how that would sound or what that would be like, but. Yeah. Well, it could, or if if it took enough samples from your voice, it would be able to synthesize your voice, and then you could type in any text you wanted to, and it could speak it out, and you know, essentially talk like you talk. But then it could, you could it could swing, it could take your voice and make it more northern or something. It would be, uh, you know, there's a lot. I'm to unique. It, really. I don't know how an AI could be like me, but anyway, look, I think it's worrying. You're right, but hopefully, it doesn't affect people's jobs. That's the thing that I guess that worries me. Well, it's going to affect everyone's jobs. It's you know, yeah. you, you say hopefully, but um, it's the speed as well, really, because you know, big companies are sort of trying to get their heads around the concept of it, but it's already happening. It's already hitting everyone. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's whether or not you know it's going to have a major impact on economies and sort of stuff. But yeah, we won't we won't go into that at the moment. We, we we'll check back in on this podcast in a year and be like, ah, oh, didn't see that coming. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on a scale of one to ten. How weird are you where 10 is the weirdest? Five. Straight down the middle. Oh, yeah, I, think, uh, I don't think I'm weird. I think I'm I'm quite normal. <laughs> don't smile, Adam, because I, I, that, that gives it away. But no, I feel like I'm just like, I'm not weird, but I'm not like, not weird mm-hmm. sort of thing. I, yeah. I, I don't know, it's hard, isn't it? I'm a five, I'm a five. What would your wife say? I think she'd say a five. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I can good, be weird. But I'm normal. I'm quite... I'm, I'm not like weird. No, I'm I'm quite. I might be. I'm, I might be unpredictable. If you gave that as a question, I'm, that would be a ten. But I'm but weird. No, I'm five. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, what, what are you? Hey. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> wait, wait, wait till my interview for that one. But uh, okay. you right. know, I, I I think yeah, about balance down the middle somewhere or the right. the, the the weirdness isn't isn't too crazy. According uh, to myself, but you know, according to yeah. others, who knows? It's it's hard to tell, really. Um, have you got a spiritual practice apart from DJing? Obviously, do you know what I would say? My passion and, and kind of like what we're doing now. Um, I would say I would say doing podcasts. It's something I've really got quite really deep into, very passionate about, and what I'm talking about as well is kind of I found really like spiritual i've learned loads from it and it's, i've done 10 so far it's been great i feel like it's, that, it, that if you asked me a year ago that would have been my answer but my answer mm-hmm. now it's definitely because it's quite a, a hot topic so um and it's something that i've really really enjoyed more than i thought i would mm-hmm. um you know so um yeah i love as you know i love doing this sort of thing so um so yeah i'd, I'd say that's kind of my 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 way of being a bit like spiritual and kind of like something I'm quite really kind of into and passionate about. I get a lot from it. Excellent. Quick, quick um, sort of sell of your podcast to us. What's it all about? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, it's called the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the DJ Scott also what, why now podcast. And basically it's, it's around 
uh, people's life and su success story from literally from where it all started as a child through to like today and what they're doing. So and I've had the, the people I've had on so far are kind of like entrepreneurs. So and as you know, I'm quite keen to do one with yourself. Um, so just to, you know, it's never, nothing's ever easy. So it's nice to see, uh, you know, how you got to where you are and the success you've had. But we all know there's loads of bumps in the road. And I feel like people will get a lot from that. So, that, so the people that I've had on from corporate people, artists, movie stars, and somebody that's just a, someone down the road kind of person that's, mm -hmm. you know, that I've just done recently. So that's something. I'm kind of like the Piers Morgan stroke uh, Stephen Bartley, <laughs> but but not as good guests yet. But uh, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Building a reputation up. Yeah. Um, what would you do in the event of a zombie apocalypse? Uh, do you know what? I think this could be a very long-winded answer, so I'll keep it short. Um, obviously, if this ever happens, um, you've got to find a safe place, right? So you've got to somehow, with your your family, your friends, if you, if you can get to them as quickly as possible, you've got to find a shelter, somewhere where it's a safe zone, if that's like... Um, because I was talking to, I was asking, I was talking about something about this quite recently. Like, can zombies get in the water? Right? Can they actually walk? Can they swim? Or <laughs> also, is is the water safe? Again, is this where you can kind of go off for here, by the way. So, do we get, do we go somewhere safe in the water, or do I find like a bunker somewhere where it's all under the ground? They can't get to me. It's all closed <laughs> off, but they come to the ground, don't they? So, it's like, but just somewhere being safe. Um, hopefully, I could survive. And if it is, they can't get in the water, then. Get a massive yacht, massive party boat, and just send it like I'd be for on, on, on a boat somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to go out. That's I'd like to go out that way. Is that a, bit, is that a right answer? Have anyone answer, answer <laughs> like that, Adam? There's so no far? such thing as a right answer on that one. It's, um, it's all, all right. about how you, how you conceive it to be a um, sort of yeah. a reality. Um, but yeah, we we can always think of the zombies as the AI robots coming for us and think, oh, okay, how True. are we going to escape True. that one? So yeah, it's uh, we might be into the territories of sort of I don't know. Let's think zombie, zombie training. Zombie gets yeah, the zombie. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? AI and go... zombie training. What do we do to kill <laughs> AI and zombies? We have to get some like machine gun, Ghostbusters kind of thing. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> um, yeah, and into the into the matrix we go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh yes, um, can you tell me something that you think you're really not very good at? That's a, that's a, oh, one second. What am I not very good at? Um, I'm not very good at letting people finish their sentences. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Yeah, <laughs> no, I was going to say. I was going to say. I get told that a lot. I don't, I don't know if it's because I've got ADHD. I don't know what it is, but I, I find it really hard to let people finish their sentences. So, and you probably know mm. that, Adam. We talk a lot on the phone. Um, I find it hard to know when to stop talking. So that's. So I would say that I'm not very good at stopping. I'm aware okay. of that well, it's, it, that. But it's good. It's good to be aware of that, though, isn't it? I mean, and you sort of. It, it, it's when you're not aware of it, everything sort of goes a bit crazy, doesn't it? But yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's great to sort of be on top of that. Um, can you tell me something that you think is true but no one else believes? I believe that. Oh, that's a good question. Actually, let me think about this one. Um, don't 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 try and bring Brexit in or something like that. No, no, I'm not, I'm not doing politics on here. Not not at all. Um, <laughs> I actually you know what this is. Uh, I believe that actually there are buckets of of uh, people, right? So say there's like ten buckets of of not talking about uh, race or cult uh, or color here. I'm talking just about that. There's sort of like ten to fifteen different types of people in buckets, right? Mm. So, and what I mean by that, so. Whatever you, if I see you right now, I would put you in a bucket, and, and everyone kind of looks and sort of acts the same, right? And I, I would say there's many of these, but when I go traveling, which I used to travel a lot of my last job, I would see someone and go, Do you know what? He looks like Adam. He reminds me of Adam, or he, he, it not remind me that you'd look, you'd have some similarities in the way you look. And mm -hmm. I believe actually that when people were made, um, they kind of like, made you into a certain way these these are sort of like what you kind of like that's your box that's your bucket and when you're born you're gonna have a little features of your parents but that's who you're in that bucket a b c d e and f because honestly i see so many people that are living in different countries i go oh my god you look like you look <laughs> like adam 
You're not, uh, you're, like the way you're acting, talking, the way you come across, you look like Adam. Or, and I see that so much. So that's what I would say to the answer is I believe that uh, we've got we're all in. We're, we've got a bucket, and we're your right. bucket A and our bucket B. Uh, but have you got a? sort of list of descriptions of all these buckets somewhere or how does that work i'm trying to find it out but no one no one shared shared, has shared that yet i'm i'll probably find it out when when that my time comes and i'll be like and i'll, I'll ask like what what bucket was i in but but i guess i can't give you the answer there. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah it's a bit of a random answer but i don't i don't know i'm not really someone that i'm not very religious if i'm honest i don't believe in certain things so no. um but you know but i do i just generally believe that there's that we are Humans have got a bucket. Mm-hmm. It's a weird answer. I'll look back at the That's years right. time and go, why did you answer that? But <laughs> that was it. But with a spark, right. that was it's the answer your, I come up with. It's your way of looking at things and looking at people and understanding differences in people as well. So that's that's fine. Um, I'm not going to get any gigs now, am I? I sit there and I look at this and go, mate, I, I think this guy's... <laughs> and not, they're not going to put me there, are they? They see this. So, yeah, it depends on depends on the client's yeah. opinion, but I'm, oh, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just tell not to look at it, this. <laughs> it's all it's all fine. Um, can you describe your ideal sandwich? My ideal sandwich would be a. I would say it's a baguette, so it's kind of sandwich still, isn't it? And I love ham. Ham is my. People laugh at me when I go to people's houses. I always nick their ham, so I love ham. Nicking their ham. <laughs> <laughs> I love ham. I don't know what it is. I've, since I was a kid, there's a bit of a joke about this. When if I go back to someone's house or for drinks and stuff or whatever, and they go, Do you want to eat to eat? He goes, Have you got any ham? I love ham. I don't know why. <laughs> I love this since I was a kid. So ham would definitely be in there. And I love, I love, I love salad cream as well with lettuce, cucumber, and tomato. Um, and that would be my ideal sandwich. What, Stroke, what kind of a subway wheat, nine, a, a foot long wheat, sort of similar to those two things. Excellent. So is that the ideal sort of bread going on there, the, the, the Subway? Love it. Love it. I love bread anyway. So um, that's why I'm 25 stone because I, like, I eat too much bread. So so bread is my go-to. So when you ask that, that's kind of now made me a bit hungry now. So it's, um, yeah, so bread's, bread's my killer really. But yeah, I'd say ham. ham a good ham get double layers. You know, it's got to be big. So a- apart from your excess bread, have you got a specific morning routine that you go through? uh at the, yeah i'd say i've got kids adam so my everything starts with kids really i guess um and get them to ready for school which just feels like it's like a war zone trying to get everyone ready so that's kind of the morning first hour and a bit um and then i would try to lie and say i, I go i go for a run which i used to do but i don't really do that at the moment but um i would say yeah and obviously I have breakfast and stuff and i've got like an office outside and um, I tend to, I'm either working from home, which is, or I'm currently looking for a job. So I'm kind of like, my routine really would be to get the kids ready, get some crumpets. I like crumpets. Get, I have to have a cup of tea as well. Uh, I need I need a cup of tea before I start. I don't know, mate, I just have to, it's all part of, I don't have that cup of tea. I don't feel like I can, hmm. can't get out of first gear. So that really helps. And then, yeah, like I'm in now, this is my little man cave stroke out of house build. It's like attached to the house. Very cold, got a little heat in there, which has to go on occasionally. And yeah, basically, this is where the magic happens. I work in sales. Excellent. and So if I'm doing, doing a bit of consulting for us or work or I'm looking for a job at the moment or working, it would all be in here. So, and this is where I spend most of my time, really. Um, and I used to actually have a, my decks behind here. So at lunchtime, I would have a little little mix, but I've, I've moved it away now because it was very distracting. Um, Too distracting, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, so I guess that kind of be it, really. It's not really exciting. Not, I should go to the gym, really, and do some other more stuff and kind of get myself ready for the day, but that would be lying, wouldn't it, to, to, to you guys? <laughs> um, so your, your last uh, question in, in this podcast is, what would your last track be that you played at the end of the world party before the world exploded and everyone said goodbye. So many songs in there. It's such a hard one. And I, it's so hard. But do you know what? I have to say, because I've had, because I've uh, been lucky enough to have a uh, kind of met this person, had a bit of a connection, stroke, I love a jingle as well. Um, I love the song called Diamond Life, um, which has got Julia McKnight to the vocals, which I've spoken to. She's even done me some, some jingles as well. Um, mm-hmm. And that song there, I just love it. It's very, very close for like, it's going to be a bit of a cheesy classic, but Show Me Love as well. That's the one I always 
remember as a song that I still play now. I love yeah. that, but I love Diamond Life. So it's a, it's a close two, maybe a little mash up if I could bash them together and, and play play like eight, eight or nine minutes rather than just four. That that would be the two, but um, but because of that slight connection I've got to um to big up Julian McKnight by the way, um I love that's the song <laughs> that I really love the vocals on that it's just absolutely amazing, um so that would be the one mate that would be the one perfect, to let me go perfect say goodbye to everyone and thank you for knowing you all before it explodes. <laughs> excellent that's good choice good choice um so yeah that's all all the questions from our side and um thank you yeah at, at this stage we'll let you get back to your um your running your your man man cave and the rest of it yeah. and uh, <laughs> um so thank you for your time today and um i believe i'll be catching up on your podcast when you're interviewing myself over the next few I weeks am. So, so watch out for sure. that by the way so you'll find out <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna ask Questions like this as well to, to Adam yeah. as well, but also to get more deeper into it. So yeah, watch out for that. We're going to organise that very soon. So um, watch out for that. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate you being on the other side of the camera for once um, and get the opportunity <laughs> to, to be grilled for once. So um, hopefully it was okay.